but you know, it's not for everybody. Like there are some people that want to work all day and just, that's all they care about. Right. That's fine. We need both. Yeah. We need all those people. But yeah, I think the employer brand and just like positioning ourselves in a competitive market in the service industry, it's like, it's hard to get good people because, you know, a lot of people want to work at a restaurant or a bar where they can make a fuckload of money and tips, but you're also staying up till three o'clock in the morning. Right. Yeah. So I'm trying to position ourselves to compete over, you know, good talent and, you know, on top of that, people that we want to hang out with and everybody enjoys hanging out with each other. And honestly, like having you involved is like a competitive edge because like people are going to want to work with you. All right. We are back in action over here at Lucadia. Our newer shop opened up almost a year ago. And actually, that's what we're going to talk about today. We've got Jordan in here. Um, we're going to be talking about what everybody wants to know, what it's like to own a coffee shop in San Diego or Southern California or own a coffee shop in general. This is our story. We have a little bit, I guess, could be a little bit different than what maybe most coffee shop owners might be. I mean, I don't know. I haven't talked to too many other ones about how they came about. But with us, I feel like we had a lot of... Uh, reps on a mini stage, Trev, wouldn't you say, before we got into actually owning and running a coffee shop with the farmer's markets and the truck and all that crap? What, what do you think? No. You don't think so? That those are good reps? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we started, we did farmer's markets for a while. So that was, um, yeah, it was pretty wild. Get I mean, a little closer so you guys. Can... How shitty was that? The, the farmer's wild. markets. It, dude, it, it kind of sucked, honestly. But it was good for us because if we just went right into a you know full on coffee shop, I think we would have been pretty fucked. We were twenty six trying to get a loan to just go into this. We would have failed, guaranteed, or we would have just yeah, we would have failed. It would have been fucked. But because we didn't have money, it forced us to go the long route of doing the farmers markets, kind of stripping and leaning up the business over time as we realize that's what it's going to take for us to be successful and to be able to open up a shop that would be, you know, badass. <laughs> that's what well, it feels like. Our whole thing has always been like, you know, let's, let's make this thing lean and mean and just be able to crank. Like I get fucking anxiety if it's not, if there's not a line out the door, right? Like yeah. if I don't, if I, happen to be driving by the shop and I see that it's, that it's not a line. I'm like, Oh fuck. But you know, that's just going to happen. But our whole thing was if we can create a line, if we can with the, our personalities or with our brand, with the way things look and the products that we offer, if we can create a line and then be able to move through that line, like to me, that would be success. And so we were able to hone in on that goal at the farmer's markets because, you know, the stakes weren't that high. Like if we didn't, if we tried something and it failed, it wasn't the end of the world where, you know, if you fucking take out a loan for 200 grand to open up a coffee shop and you fail, you kind of fucked. You're going <laughs> to you're gonna default on that loan, right? So everything kind of worked out to put us into the right you know, practice mode for the the day that we would be able to open up an actual brick and mortar. Um, so yeah, I mean, farmers markets were rough, man. It was like camping every single weekend, two days, like, you know, packing up to go camping on a Saturday, packing up to go home Saturday night, and then Sunday morning, packing up again to go camping for the day and then <laughs> bringing everything back home. Well, and this is when we had the super cush life of, working the whole weekend and then during the week we didn't have farmers markets but initially we had farmers markets five or six days a week so it was camping five or six days a week in places that we didn't necessarily want to go on a monday evening all the way down to north park like they didn't want to go down there yeah what what farmers markets were you guys we did hitting? north park pb encinitas del mar uh lucadia uh la jolla what else is that about it Something like that. Did you say Little Italy? 
Little Italy. Okay. Yeah. Down you have or, to pay to be like I'm assuming, right? You got to pay something to be. Yeah, yeah. There's there are the percentages or flat rate, which was uh, nice because then it's like the more you make, it's not like the farmers market. You know what I mean? Yeah. Flat rate's always kind of interesting, but um, I think getting into uh, opening the shop, we didn't just say, "Hey, man!" Like we both saved up, you know, a bunch of money and. I think a co- owning a coffee shop would be really cool. Let's go try and do it and figure it out. We had spent years figuring it out. So when it came to the shop, it was like, I mean, I'm speaking for myself, but I think Trev might feel the same way of, I, we're, I was pretty confident in like, we're gonna make this happen because we do it on just a smaller scale, but now we have like space to kind of spread out and really like do something. Right. It wasn't like, fuck, like, how do, what are we going to do? How are we going to like operate this? It's like, dude, we've been doing that for years in a shitty little tent thing. Now we have power that's steady. We have water. We don't have things running out. We don't have rain all on top of our heads. We don't have all that stuff. And we have customers who now trust us because at the markets, they're like, why should I buy from you? Right. Yeah. The whole time we were in the farmer's markets, we would, it, the whole <laughs> thing was like, how can we build out our little tent? to be basically just a small, like portable version of what our actual shop would be. So every little, you know, change that we made was in the background was, okay, this is how it would fit into a brick and mortar. So basically like the setup that we had at the farmer's markets towards the end was how the Cardiff shop kind of turned out. Um, You know, obviously some things are different, but. Almost exact outline though, as our 10 by 10, 10. Yeah. Now it's a, Carter shops like a 13 by 20. Yeah, it's 420 <laughs> square feet. Apparently. <laughs> yeah. But that was, uh, that was crucial for us and our success. So other people have different routes, but for us, that's how we did it. The shops, um, it was relatively easy and we had some employees then. So that was, that was probably the biggest challenge wasn't like, how are we going to handle, you know, a few more items on our menu? Cause at the farmer's markets, we only did coffee was never about that it was how are we going to handle staff how are we going to get quality people to to kind of understand our vision and help us to help them like grow in this um you know in this business so that was always the tough i think is the toughest thing about owning a shop is for sure getting good staff we had a like in the farmer's markets, a lot of people kind of bounce around from this tent to that tent. And they work over there on that Saturday and on Sunday, they go sell guac. And on another day they sell eggs and it's just kind of like hired, hired hands and help. But here we wanted to get people that who were like down with this and like would help us build community. And cause we under, we started to understand that that was like the most important thing and what, what everybody was missing, especially in Cardiff. We felt like everybody was missing like a place, like there's a million coffee shops. Everyone's like, oh, another coffee shop, another coffee shop. It's like, yeah, we're, we're providing, like, yeah, we're selling more coffee, but we're a community place. And I think a lot of people realize that. And that's the, I think the biggest impact that we had was like our focus wasn't so much on sniffing coffee and, oh, we do coffee just like everybody else. It's like, yo, we're here to build a, build something different where people can come hang, yeah coffee's a catalyst and we're going to do that really well, but it was more about building a shop that can serve people in a bunch of different ways. Yeah. Jordan, what do you like, what do you think is different about us? Like from a, just like face value, like be nice. <laughs> no, you two are the shop, <laughs> no, the shop. Like no. what's the difference between how we do things versus any other coffee shop? Um, not that other coffee shops are doing it wrong. A lot of them are doing it really good uh, but just maybe kind of like shed some light on what makes us a little different the people and just like having very like few options life is over complicated we have so much in our face everyday decisions that we have to make and it's kind of like it's refreshing coming into a place having a few things to pick from do you want something hot do you want something cold cool all right next question we got three different kinds of milk or nothing in it. Like simple. Yeah. There's no, like, it, it doesn't take a lot of thought. You just kind of be like, okay, I want some hot, sweet. 
and then it's good. Yeah. And I think that actually gives us more time to focus on chatting with people, building relationships. It's more like a bar where we make coffee in a way that produces super high quality, like really good, like bold flavor, but like don't have to tend to a machine and turn it on and off and then froth milk and do all those things that take, you know, pretty like, you have to be pretty focused to make sure that you're making a cappuccino correctly or a latte latte correctly. So this, you, you can't see past the big ass machine either. Like we're sitting here, like most of the people in the shop can shoot the shit while they make coffee. Yeah. You're not like hiding behind some big thing and a big counter in front of you. You're there. It's FaceTime. Yeah, wow. exactly. So, um, that's probably the biggest difference I think for us. We, and it was when we first started and Ryan and I would talk about the concept of, of what we wanted to do it was always a, there was always a layer of like, let's do something different so that we stand out in a sense that like, if we just do everything that everybody else does, we're just going to blend in with everybody else. And we didn't want to do that. We wanted to create something that was unique, different and fun. And so in our opinion, this is that, like it's the most fun coffee shop that there can be. You know, because we have the ability to shoot the shit and we're not, we don't have to pay attention yet. Despite all of that, we're producing really high quality coffee drinks. It might not be a cappuccino or a latte, but it is a good cup of coffee and the cold brew is really good. And the empanadas are really, really good. Mm -hmm. And the orange juice is the best, right? So not a lot of options, but really high quality stuff. Um, so to kind of get back to like the premise of the, of this podcast, you know, what it's like to own uh, a coffee shop in San Diego, I think it's different for us in the sense that we've really taken this angle that isn't a normal coffee shop, you know? So it's different for us, but it's also, it, it can provide some sort of uh, insight into not just owning a coffee shop or running a coffee shop. It's like a bigger business type of, uh, like idea of like how to differentiate yourself so that you separate yourself. You create like a little bit of a moat around your business so that people can't really associate with you in a sense. You don't blend in. You're completely separate on your own little island doing something that nobody else is doing. So that kind of creates just a little bit of attention, I think. Even if, even if I don't think we did a good job, I think it would just still create attention just based on the fact that it was different. Yeah, absolutely. And I, it, that's, that's kind of the, it all comes back to community and like creating a community at the shops because that eventually, I mean, that's really the, that's the foundation of our business is our, is our crew or everybody that comes in here and being able to everything goes together. So being able to have a simple concept to connect with people and do that, all it does is build community that reinforces that we're here more than just pouring you a drink and drawing some stuff on the top of the foam. Like we're here to shoot the shit about what your kids are doing, what's going on, connect you with this person, connect you with that person, so on and so on. Cause that's just, that's life. And to us, that's what we wanted our coffee shop to be like. Um, we don't, I mean, one thing that's that's actually pretty simple and I think has made a, uh, a big impact on like kind of where we're at is the fact that we're probably one of the only coffee shops, I don't know, we can look this up, that does not offer Wi-Fi. And a big reason is because we don't want people to come sit here and sit on the computer and no one talk to each other. You come into our shop on a weekend there's not computers. Everyone's talking, communicating. You have no choice but to communicate with each other because you're sitting there and it's like, what are you going to just <laughs> be all awkward and weird and not talk, right? Yeah. yeah. And like that has then built this foundation. So when things come up like coronavirus and COVID, 
we have a backing that allowed us to get through that. Yeah. And, you know, it, it impacted a lot of businesses and owning a business at that time was definitely pretty, uh, you know, pretty scary. I mean, I think Trev and I were like, dude, what do you like, how long do you think it's going to last? And we're like, ah, maybe a couple of weeks, two or three weeks. Like, fuck it. Maybe we just go take a vacation, go on a trip or something. And then, then it continued to go on and on and on. And we had to kind of figure out this was right before this was right. Yeah. This is yeah. right before you got involved and Trev and I had to let go, um, all our employees. And then we just stood in here in the Cardiff shop. We didn't have this one yet. And we just said, fuck it, dude, we're not going to close. Like we see this differently again. We see the coffee shop differently. We see creating our own path in our lives a little bit differently than people. So we saw the COVID and like how people were reacting. We're like, that's not how we are. We're going to work through this. And because of the way that we built the community and all that, they literally community said to us, if you guys stay open, we're fucking going to be here every day. If you guys are, and that's what happened. And we that skyrocketed our business. Right. Yeah. And if it wasn't for COVID and all these weird things that went on over those, that year, Jay wouldn't be involved. And then we wouldn't have another person as we're kind of spreading out between the shops and like, the warehouse and all things going on, we now have another person who truly deep down has the same vision and like love for the business and understands community and like the connections. I mean, shit, there's times where I'm in the shop in Cardiff and I hadn't been in there in a minute. And I see some people who I've known, like they were first customers and they, they're not like, oh, Ryan, you're back in the shop. It's like, oh, where's Jordan working today? I'm like, what the fuck, dude? I haven't seen you in months. And these dudes are asking about Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> like, what's that guy doing for you? What was he putting in your coffee? But yeah, I think that's uh, people is a big thing to have in running a business. And that's definitely the biggest thing, which is we're fortunate to have him amongst our other really good uh, employees. But I think, I mean... The community aspect is what you brought you to us, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because we start, we met you at the farmer or at the coffee truck, and then it was like you came over like two days after Zeppelin was born, and was like, "Yo, bro, I'm at Cardiff. Like, check out my new baby." And I walked out to your car, and there's a brand new baby sitting, <laughs> not sitting in your trunk because it was a SUV, so the tr- trunk was open, but. Yeah, she's he was laying in the trunk, and I was like, "Oh hell yeah, Check dude!" Him out. Yeah, he's like, "Look at this fresh baby." Yeah, <laughs> it was pretty awesome. Okay, but, so do you want to talk a little bit about like the nuts and bolts of running a business in terms of, uh, I don't know, I guess you know, running a coffee shop in San Diego is probably a little bit different than say running a coffee shop in San Francisco or something like that because of just like, um, like walking traffic or like weather um well we we definitely um you would think that like maybe up in the pacific northwest or in cold areas and cities and stuff when it's cold and rainy everyone's like oh let's go to a coffee shop that's not the same here like in san diego north county where we're at i would say that when it's raining and it's like people are I think it's because we have so many sunny days and so many good days where everybody's out doing stuff all the time that anytime we get a little bit, it's an excuse to be like, oh, I just want to chill inside and like kind of hide for and be cozy. Yeah, I think it also might have to do with like our two shops are a little bit smaller and the Cardiff one, for instance, is like pretty much all outdoor. It's like a small little like hole in the wall. And then this one has only got like four stools inside. Uh, but just in general, like the, the weather, I think affects people in San Diego a little bit more. So that's one thing that if you were, you know, thinking about opening a coffee shop in in San Diego or an area that's got a lot of sunny days, some things to take into account would be like, if you want to mitigate slow days when it's bad weather, maybe you have a bigger space, obviously that's going to cost you more money. Um, but then also, yeah, you just gotta be, uh, to me, it's like, you have to be a little bit more aware of the weather so that maybe 
you change the schedule a little bit. Somebody doesn't need to come in or a second person doesn't need to come in as early where like during the summer when it's like, you know, sunny and 80 degrees for the next four months, like you gotta be pretty staffed up like all day, every day, because it can get busy, especially with the tourism around here during the summer, it just goes off. Like the Cardiff shop is just crazy. There's a campground right across the street that is fully booked out. And yeah, so when you're running a coffee shop or any other types of business, you wanna look at the other businesses in the area to see how they're doing, what times you, you could even go talk to some of the owners and say, hey, yeah. what, you know, are you guys busy all year long? Is there a off season? Yeah, you know, how much tourism do you get? Does weather affect you? Uh, all those little things um, versus a city like San Francisco or, you know, Chicago or New York, where it's just like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> like it's always going to be yeah. busy. People um, need coffee there in a different kind of way. Right. And, um, and then also like kind of, I think another big thing that people think about is like the, the stuff you have to deal with specifically in the shops. Trev and I became, which is, I can't wait to hear Jordan, but Trev and I became pretty numb to this because in the farmer's market, every single thing was a variable. Every machine was breaking every other hour. So we're just boom, boom, boom. So when we get into a nice shop that has new equipment and everything like that, it's not so hands-on with that because we've had so much experience. But Jordan, not having coming from farmer's markets for years, but when Trev and I are gone and you're running everything, what kind of like what kind of things you run into where you're like, oh fuck, like this would be kind of a pain in the ass. We're, uh, we're like fortunate that we don't really have to deal with much of that. Making cold brew is probably like the biggest headache right now, just making sure that we have enough going into a busy weekend. We have enough empanadas on hand for the day because I always have this weird fear of like selling out, which isn't even a bad thing, right? If you don't have it, it just makes somebody want it more. So they'll probably come back the next day and get it. So I think forecasting, right, is it's probably a thing to focus on. Forecasting is really it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's we're. I mean, like I've heard horror stories about what you guys had to go through to get here. We're super lucky that you know we don't really have much of that, and our crew's big enough, strong enough to where if we're missing something, somebody can go out and get it real quick because somebody can hold down the fort all by himself. Small enough shops to where it sucks, but you can do it all by yourself if you have to. So you send somebody to go get what you need. And I think a, a thing that we also had with our employees is we would rather you do something and maybe mess it up than not do anything at all. Because yeah. standing still and not moving and doing it, making action is, that's just, that's the worst thing you can do, especially in life too. You don't like. Yeah. I think for us, it's just really trying to have it all dialed in. I mean, for a while it was just me and Ryan that we're, we're taking care of everything. So you know, being able to delegate some tasks to other team members really helps in terms of giving yourself the space to be able to think about things like having Maddie, you know, being involved for the last year, year and a half or so, and her really owning the whole inventory, inventory aspect of everything and ordering has really helped us grow and made taking on another shop a lot easier. And then having you involved in terms of like making sure that the community is being taken care of and is being communicated with and setting up events and, you know, again, taking some of the work off of Ryan and I's hands that we were doing, it just, it helps a lot. It gives you the space It like you start to gain clarity on what's, you know, what other things can be done that weren't necessarily time sensitive before, but like were needed to get done to grow the business. But when you're in the thick of it and, you know, you run out of one thing, it's like, how can you even think about the next three years when you're just thinking about right now, you know, we ran out of something or the cold brew, you know, this or the freaking hot water machine is broken or the ice machine stopped producing ice or one of our fucking outlets is <laughs> busted or whatever. When all that kind of shit is happening, it's like you don't really have time to think for anything else. But you know, having a couple of other people take some stuff off of our hands is really, really helpful. Um, and then, you know, everybody that works with us right now that's on the team, I feel so confident that they can 
think critically if something were to happen, they don't immediately just pick up the phone and call me or Ryan. They actually just handle the problem, you know? And then we find out about it later and it's like, that's fucking awesome. I didn't even know that that happened. And I'm glad I didn't even have to hear about it because by the time you spend calling someone else to figure out something, you could have figured out two, three different ways to troubleshoot or like make something happen. And I, and I think that the things that we have to deal with owning a shop, it goes back to, yeah, when you're on your own, it's tough and you got to learn and do that, but it goes back to hiring the right people. And in order to hire the right people, it goes to building a culture that attracts the people who are attracted to that type of lifestyle and that type of culture. Well, you guys also, you would like empower us to do that. Like, yeah, it was like, I know please. a lot of places where <laughs> like, you know, you work somewhere, something goes wrong and you got to wait until your boss tells you what to do. Here, it's like, dude, figure it out, get it done, handle it. And then let me know later, like you said. Like, it would make me happy when I'm like, dude, just do it. Fuck it up. I don't care. Like, I'm going to be stoked knowing that you just said, dude, I tried to wing it. I tried to do it. Sorry, I messed this up. Like, I'm pumped when I hear that because it's like, you were just going for it. Like, I'm not expecting you who's been working in a shop for a couple of years to know how to do these things that I've been doing for 10 years. You know what I mean? It's like, but that's the mentality. And that just, again, comes back to people and who we have in place. That's how you build a car. That's what it's like working in a coffee shop is building a place based upon your employees. How do you find good people? Uh, For us, like always a reference is better. Like that's how we initially started. It was like, oh, somebody who knows who we are and knows what we want, like close people would be then like, huh, I know what these guys want and what they expect. Um, I think that this person might work well. That's how we found some employees. But then I think it comes back to us being true to who we are and sticking to our brand and sticking to like the culture that we're trying to build. And it just attracts people, dude. Like it attracted you for some reason, you know what I mean? And it, 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 like something inside you said, dude, I want to be a part of this. Like, I don't know. There's a stigma about coffee shops and in the sense of like, I don't want to work in a coffee shop. Like, I don't know. I've told people over the years, when somebody asks what I do for work, I'm like, oh, I work in a coffee shop. And they're like, oh, sick. As if it's like not a cool thing. But what, did, like, did you think you were going to work in a coffee shop, Jordan? Like, Never. did you think you were going to be a part of a coffee brand making pour, making a million pour overs and like fucking doing what you do here? No, no. Like, yeah, if you would have asked me 10 years ago, I would have said you're probably crazy. I was focused highly on like the traditional oh i need to work a nine to five i need to make a lot of money i need to do this that um but you know you try stuff like that and you're just absolutely fucking miserable don't get to see my kids like for the first half of bradley's life basically i was i'd see him for a couple hours in the evening and that was it there's way more to life than just chasing money and i think being happy and being around good people is absolutely like way more valuable in the long term yeah yeah i think to kind of answer your question of how we find good people so like our brand as an employer i think is super important it's something that a lot of companies focus on but it's not really talked about too much because i think a lot of companies don't want to like make it make other people or other companies like so aware that that's something that they're focusing on it's a competitive edge you see it in tech where like, you know, you always hear these stories of like Google and they have all these games and free food and unlimited PTO and Mm -hmm. all this kind of shit. And so for us, like, obviously we can't offer free food every day or, you know, unlimited PTO and all those things. But I think that like being a part of a brand, like you said, where there's these perks of, you know, you're, you're known in the community and, you know, quite honestly, like people that come to the shop will drop off like, clothes from like Volcom or you know Nixon or you know electric codes or, or codes and shit like that it's like there's like all these little perks just based off the community that we've created but then like you know we Sarah she's like always trying to go snowboarding or surfing and stuff and it works for her because the hours are good and we pay good you know so it like it she's able to like stitch it all together and like live the life that she wants to live um 
but you know, it's not for everybody. Like there are some people that want to work all day and just, that's all they care about. Right. That's fine. We need both. Yeah. We need all those people. But and, yeah, I think the employer brand and just like positioning ourselves in a competitive market in the service industry, it's like, it's hard to get good people because you know, a lot of people want to work at a restaurant or a bar where they can make a fuckload of money and tips, but you're also staying up till three o'clock in the morning. Right. Yeah. So I'm trying to position ourselves to compete over, you know, good talent and, you know, on top of that, people that we want to hang out with and everybody enjoys hanging out with each other. And honestly, like having you involved is like a competitive edge. Cause like people are going to want to work with you. Yeah. Right. Like having that culture of like cool people, Sarah, Mike, Drew, like Riley and Maddie, everybody is cool. And like, and Robbie. Oh yeah. Fuck Baha Rob. Rob. Baha, Baha, Rob. <laughs> Baha Rob. Um, but yeah, I mean, having that brand as an employer is like super critical. Like Sarah came in here when, before she worked and she was like, Oh, this place is cool. And like, right then just based off of how it looked and what the vibe was, you know, she wanted to work here and same with you. It was like, you see what we're doing and how we interact with people. It's like, that's what brings people in. That's what draws them in. Um, and then from there, it's like, if it's a good match, like the hardest part is being able to keep people because, you know, good people are always getting hit up to like for other opportunities. And so, you know, trying to, to grow with each other is like a really difficult thing, you know, but, um, yeah. Yeah. I think it comes back to really pushing that vision and people will either, you know, latch onto it or they won't, or this might be a stepping stone or whatever it is, but at least, uh, that's definitely how we kind of, get good employees, good team members. Um, and then through all that and through the community, I think there's one thing that recently has definitely impacted us, which affects the fact of what, how we built such a good community that trusts us with the transparency of what's going on in the economy and how that affects our prices and like that kind of thing. Trev, if you want to explain a little bit <laughs> oh, on okay. like, Another challenge as a shop, like we don't, the coffee culture can get so expensive, right? And like you can go and get a $10 pour. I mean, the shit you see now is like incredible. We don't ever want to be known as like those just expensive ass, like blah, blah, blah. But we are providing something super delicious and high quality. But there is that balance of understanding like with COVID and and like how prices have changed and how we are like, you know, explain. yeah. So no. I think, you know, obviously inflation is rising or did rise with COVID. There's a lot of weird financial aspects that were taking place during COVID after COVID and still kind of happening today. Shipping costs have gone up a lot. I think we're paying probably a dollar per pound of coffee more than we were three, four, five years ago. Um, so things have just gotten more expensive. My worst, like the conversation that I hate to have the most is a conversation with our other business partner when we're talking about having to raise prices. I hate that because I want a place that doesn't gouge people. But at the same time, customers need to understand that if we don't charge enough money, to meet our margins, then we're just going to put ourselves out of business. And it's, it's like really hard for me internally to say, fuck, we gotta, we gotta raise the price on something by 50 cents or 25 cents or whatever it is. Um, it's always like an inter it's a dilemma every single time. Um, but it just, as a business owner, you have to do it or else you're going to disappear. And, that's not fair to Ryan and I, or it's not even, it's more for employees. Like if we don't raise prices and then we can't afford to pay people and then the whole thing shuts down. So if you're a customer and you come into a small business or you know anything, not even just us, if you go to a, I used to be the type of person that would walk into some place and like kind of scoff at prices, but being in it now, I, I understand why things are more expensive, especially for small, like local businesses. 
if I'm at Walmart and I see something that I think is overpriced, like I'll still scoff, but <laughs> yeah. you know, local businesses independently owned, like those people are trying to make a living and it's only fair that they do right by their business, by their family, their spouse, their girlfriend, their husband, their wife, whatever. They have to run a business in a healthy way so that they can exist for a longer period of time. Um, yeah. And honestly, I just don't, I don't know if it's ever going to come back down. <laughs> it's like, it's tough. But one thing that we've always tried to do to combat ri rising prices is volume to try to increase the volume so that we can generate enough cash to you know, pay all the bills, pay all the employees, be able to buy more coffee to invest in new types of coffee, uh, new packaging, more sustainable packaging, you know, higher quality coffee, all that kind of stuff. So you can't really do any of those things unless you're, you know, charging proper margins. So hopefully everybody understands that. I know it sucks sometimes when you go to a coffee shop and, or a, any type of restaurant and you look at the pricing and it's like way more than what you thought it should be. But I think generally speaking, food service, restaurants, coffee shops, bars, they're already operating on pretty tight margins. It's place might be busy, but like the amount of money that they're actually making on each transaction is probably not as much as you think. Um, so, and, it, and costs are high when you're, when you're, you know, you have a lot of staff or, you know, especially in an area like North County, San Diego, like rent is not cheap. So in order to be able to cover rent, shit like that, you have to be able to charge margins. You have to be able to make your margins. So, yeah. Yeah. That's kind of the, the financial talk. I hate that so much because it sucks. Like I hate the feeling of people coming in. Not, it doesn't happen a lot because we don't even charge for like oat milk or cream or coconut milk or anything like that. We just charge a one time X amount of money per cup. It's four fifty for a small and five fifty for a large. And like, that's the end of it. Unless you add CBD, we do charge for that, but you know, trying to just keep it super simple and straightforward and not, not raise our prices too much, but yeah, it's tough. I mean, that's, those are the little things that have to, you know, they have to be done. Yeah. And, but there's know. also, sometimes I'll go to coffee shops. And I'm like, geez, you need to raise your prices. Well, that's <laughs> definitely because some, it's, yeah, you, you know, sometimes you see like, it's like, well, you can buy like a little bit better coffee and then charge like more than you would think. Right. Yeah. Like if you are, if you're serving a quality product, you'll be able to charge like that much extra and you'll be able to make a little bit more margin, even though the cost might be higher, people will pay more for better quality. Well, so and like, it drives more, it'll drive more people, which will then increase the volume of like, oh, there's better stuff here. Yeah. And then trying to run the whole, you know, there's places that do succeed on cheap ass coffee that tastes shitty because there's, a, there's a, you know, an age group or maybe not an age group, but there's, there's people that love that stuff that they grew up on. And the Folgers? Yeah. And it, or whatever it is, burnt, terrible tasting coffee that we would think. And they're like, that's what I need. That those places survive on making that type of coffee. But for San Diego or any, I guess now it's third wave coffee. If you were to get into coffee shops now and start a coffee shop, you'd be considered third wave, right? you're going to, you're going to have to definitely provide, I think to be successful more than just really delicious coffee. You gotta, you gotta get that community. You gotta get that culture so you can attract good employees to then attract their own little communities, which then help build the bigger picture. And then when shit goes on like COVID and all these other things, you have the support built in already. You're not relying a hundred percent on tourism or anything like that. Because when that shit goes away, you still got your people that walk down the street. They come and get your coffee every fucking day. And that's how. <laughs> yeah. that's Anything else, Jordan? Yeah, what do you think, Jay? I'm good. Jordan's just a fucking killer over here. I'm good, though. killer. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, that is what it's like. I'm sure there's a lot more. If you have any questions, you can hit us up. And we could try to answer them in another podcast. But I think that kind of sums it up for what it's like to own a coffee shop. Like I said, we're way different. So it's, you know, you're probably going to hear a different story from a different type of coffee shop owner, but for us, 
I was pretty run and gun and, you know, thankful for the people that work with us. I would definitely say the most important thing is the people. So find good people that you can trust and, and you believe in and you should be good no matter what angle you're taking in coffee shop business or any other type of business. It's always about the people. So, all right, that's going to be it for this episode. We'll see you on Spotify or YouTube. Please subscribe and, you know, comment and like all the, all the stuff we're putting out. It really helps us. You just got to type in bump coffee, bump coffee, the bump coffee podcast, and uh, you should be able to find it on either platform, but yeah, thanks again. And we'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you.